静かに。Then came the Mongolians. Yup, that's us, just in the neighborhood. Nothing to see here, except for the exceptionally large army on boats. We have to kick your holy sh. This brought the entire samurai armies of the whole nation to mobilize in 1274 and 1281, a full scale invasion that was launched by Kublai Khan of the Mongolian Empire. Listen, we're here just looking to start something to pillage your little island and take for our own, that's all. Just give up. Though outnumbered by an enemy equipped with superior weaponry, the Japanese fought the Mongols to a standstill in Kyushu on both occasions. Yes, both occasions. They actually came twice, not really learning from the first time. Their Mongol fleet was destroyed by typhoons called Kamikaze, meaning divine wind or a tornado. Depends on how you want to look at it. You guys are so lucky there was no one steering our ships, like no one. Kamakura shogunates were victorious, but their finances depleted and they actually weren't able to pay its peeps. And you know what happens when people don't get paid? Shogunate's relations with the samurai class went south. No pay? Are you kidding me? After all that, we saved Japan, you guys are done? We just ran out of money. Isn't saving Japan enough? And here's your answer. In 1333, Emperor Godaigo started this rebellion against the shogunate so the imperial court could have its full power again. General Ashikaga Takuji was sent by the shogunate to stop the revolt, but what happened was that Takuji and his men instead joined forces with Emperor Godaigo and overthrew the Kamakura shogunate. Bet you didn't see that one coming. Ooh. Backstabbing. Anyways, Japan entered good times and people started to have babies again. We like making babies. Growing the population. There were farmers that started using new irrigation techniques like iron tools and fertilizer that pretty much doubled cropping productivity and brought more food to everyone. Free food for everyone. Just kidding, you still have to pay for it. Ignore that guy. Boy, damn it. All seemed great, but Ashikaga Shogunate, Takuji, and many other samurai soon became dissatisfied with Emperor Godaigo's Kenmu restoration to monopolize power in the imperial court. Did you forget that we were the ones who betrayed our former leader, thinking you'd pay us more? But nope, it's the same thing, nothing is different. Takuji rebelled after Godaigo refused to appoint him shogun. You just mess with the wrong people. Then in 1338, Takuji captured Kyoto and installed a rival member of the imperial family to the throne, Emperor Komyo, who did appoint him shogun. Finally, someone who gets it. Although we kind of forced him to. Iko. Iko. Godaigo said hell no and responded by fleeing to the southern city of Yoshino, where he decided to set up a rival government that led to a super long conflict between the northern court and the southern court. Takauji set up his shogunate in the Muromachi district of Kyoto, styling themselves as the feudal lords, called daimyos, of their domains and often even refused to obey the shogun. You know what? The daimyos are the new kids on the block. We answer to no one. My anime, misugi janai. But the kid that brought it all together was Takuji's grandson, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, who came to power in 1368 and remained influential until his death in 1408. Yep, I brought it all together. But later on, a more violent period of civil war came around that started in 1467 when the Oning War broke out over who would succeed the ruling shogun. The daimyos took sides. I'm on your side, dude. I'm on yours. And decided to burn Kyoto into flames. At the end of it all, in 1477, the shogun had lost all power over the daimyo. Who now ruled hundreds of independent states throughout Japan. I just wanted to say, I'm going to throw you down the stairs. The warring states started, where the daimyos fought among themselves for the control of the country. I have power. No, you don't. I do. Like these daimyos and this guy. This was when the ninjas came out. Remember how they were popular in the 1980s for a brief period? Anyways, they were skilled spies and assassins hired by daimyos. But few definite historical facts are known about the secretive lifestyles of the ninja, who actually became the subject of many legends, especially in the 1980s. Then the Portuguese came in too. They wanted a piece of it all. Hello there. Obrigado. They brought their trading ships in 1543. 
to an island called Tanegashima, just south of Kyushu. The three Portuguese traders on board were the first Europeans to set foot in Japan. We were the first Europeans to set foot. Obrigado. New products started to flow into Japan, and the musket soon became a favorite. What katana? Pistol no hora. In 1556, the daimyos were using about 300,000 muskets in their armies. The Portuguese even brought the Christian religion, and we all know what happens in history when religion comes into play. It made 350,000 believers in Japan enough for an army. Nothing to see here, only God. Move along, move along. Commercial and cultural exchange began to really flourish between Japan and the West. Even the first map of Japan in the West was represented in 1568 by the Portuguese. Uh, this is what Japan looks like, guys. So where should we invade? Shh, not so loud. Obrigado. The Portuguese were allowed to trade and create colonies where they could convert new believers into the Christian religion. The Portuguese even found ways to take advantage of the civil war in Japan. And in 1561, forces under Otomo Sōryū attacked the castle in Moji with an alliance with the Portuguese, who provided three ships with a crew of about 900 men and more than 50 cannons. And this is actually in the history books as being the first bombardment by foreign ships on Japan. Yes, we were the first Europeans to set foot in Japan, as well as the first Europeans to go to war with Japan. Religion has nothing to do with it at all. Yes, it did. Obrigado. Now in 1565 was the first recorded naval battle between the Europeans and the Japanese. It took place in Fukuda Bay and the daimyo Matsura Takanobu attacked two Portuguese trade vessels at Hirado port. This had the Portuguese traders flee to Nagasaki. Damn it, they know how to use our muskets and cannons. Run! Now this guy here, Oda Nobunaga, entered and started using European technology and firearms to conquer many other daimyos in what's called the Azuchi Momoyama period. You guys keep using your katanas. But Oda Nobunaga was later assassinated in 1582 where this guy, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, unified the nation in 1590. Wait, that's the end of the story for me? I'm the great Oda Nobunaga. Hideyoshi even tried to launch two unsuccessful invasions of Korea in 1592 and 1597. I like to start fights with everyone. Anihasigo Kamisamida Tokugawa Ieyasu was someone who served for Hideyoshi's son, Toyotomi Hideyori, and used his position to gain political and military support. Yeah, I kind of used you, but you were so usable. Arigato ne. Rival clans of Ieyasu were taken down, and in 1603, the Tokugawa shogunate of Edo made these new rules to control the other daimyos, and in 1639, he even started what's called the Sakoku, closed country policy that lasted a while. And in 1639, he even started what's called the Sakoku, closed country policy, that lasted a while, two and a half centuries of political unity known as the Edo period. And it ended the Portuguese influence after 100 years in Japanese territory. Nice try guys. Obrigado for staying in Japan. But stop bringing your stuff that kill us. Now get out. You're too much trouble. More kuruna. Obrigado. Now let's look more closely at what happened during this time period in the Azuchi Momoyama period. During this time, Japan slowly unified under two powerful warlords, Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Oyasumi, ohayou gozaimasu. Now, Oda Nobunaga is an interesting point in Japan's history and should be talked about in more detail. Oh good, I'm back. Yeah, I'm important and you skipped over me too quickly by killing me often. But in 1582, Oda Nobunaga suddenly came into the picture. Yup, me, me, and more me. Genki desu ka? And during the Battle of Okihazama, his army defeated a force several times its size led by the powerful daimyo Imagawa Yoshimoto. Now Nobunaga was pretty cunning, known for his strategic leadership and his ruthlessness. I'm a bad boy. He further used the Christian religion to incite hatred towards his Buddhist enemies and to forge strong relationships with European arms merchants. He loved the muskets and trained with them with innovative tactics. I like God and guns. Buddhists suck. 
No, you don't. He didn't get and he recruited anyone who was talented and promoted them. He didn't really care about their social status like most of the other leaders did and included his peasant servant Toyotomi Hideyoshi who actually became one of his best generals. Ooh. Yeah, I was a peasant, but now I'm here to kick your butt. What do I keep on this? During this period in Azuchi Momoyama in 1568, Nobunaga actually conquered Kyoto and thus effectively brought an end to the Ashikaga Shogunate. He was super close in reuniting all of Japan in 1582 when one of his own officers, Akichi Mitsuhide, killed him as mentioned earlier. This ends my part, I guess. Hideyoshi was actually pissed and avenged Nobunaga by crushing Akichi's uprising and emerged as Nobunaga's successor and it was Hideyoshi that completed the unification of Japan by conquering Shikoku, Kyushu, and the lands of the Hojo family in eastern Japan. And now that Hideyoshi was the ruler, he looked over Japan and said, things need to change, time to tweak everything. So he decided to take away the swords from the peasantry, place new restrictions on the daimyos, persecutions of Christians, and a new law that effectively forbid peasants and samurai from changing their social class. You're born a peasant, you die a peasant. He actually started having thoughts of invading China for Japan being called Wa in the past from China and not really liking K-pop. That joke was dead from the previous vlog. Not funny. Let's move on. And I like K-pop. And even launched two massive invasions of Korea starting in 1592. But both attacks of China and the Korean armies had failed and ended after his death in 1598 the power got to my head. He wanted to form a new dynasty under his infant son, Yorotomi Hideyori, and asked his most trusted subordinates to pledge loyalty. Could you please? He's my son. Onigaishimasu. Yeah, okay, sure. But what happened right after Hideyoshi died was a war that broke out between Hideyori's allies and those loyal to Tokugawa Ieyasu, the daimyo and a former ally of Hideyoshi. Tokugawa Ieyasu actually won a decisive victory at the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, which led to 268 uninterrupted years of rule by the Tokugawa clan. Enter early modern Japan. Edo period. Now Tokugawa Ieyasu was the founder and first shogun of the Tokugawa shogunate. There is this kind of peace and stability during the Edo period where modern Tokyo stands today. Emperor Goyoze declared Tokugawa Ieyasu shogun and Ieyasu abdicated two years later to groom his son as the second shogun of what became a long destiny. I must have done a great job, my boy really turned out well. Now learning from past history, the Tokugawa shogunate did their best to suppress social unrest like crucifixes, beheadings, and death by boiling. Sounds pretty barbaric, but given past history, they felt it was the only alternative at the time. They even had punishments for the most minor offenses to instill absolute fear into its people. The criminals of high social class were often given the option of seppuku, self disbowment an ancient form of suicide that became ritualized. The punishments were definitely not a time to be proud of. They even started to look at the Christian religion as a potential threat and completely outlawed it after the Christian-led Shimabara Rebellion of 1638. They even went as far as preventing further foreign ideas from flowing in and the third Tokugawa shogun implemented the Sakoku closed country policy. And under this isolationist policy, Japanese people were not allowed to travel abroad, return from overseas, or build ocean-going vessels. Nothing to see out there anyways. Stay here. Enjoy being tracked. The only Europeans allowed into Japan were the Dutch, who were granted a single trading post on the island of Dijima. We are special. China and Korea were also the only other countries permitted to trade as well. But the first century of Tokugawa rule brought Japan's population to 30 million mostly because of agricultural growth. The city populations grew mostly in the rural areas and literacy and a number of private schools greatly expanded. Some say it had the world's highest rate of education at the time, comparable to that of some European countries. During the Edo period of 1798, the samurai during this time had power and could kill a commoner for the slightest insult and were widely feared by the Japanese population. Hey, 
we weren't that bad, just a little aggressive. The merchant classes actually grew as well, especially in wealth, and began spending their income on cultural and social pursuits. They lived in this kind of world called the yukio, floating world. There were forms of theater like the kabuki and the bunraku puppet theater that became widely popular with short songs and music played on the shamisen, a new import to Japan in 1600. Haiku even developed, and the geishas formed a new profession of entertainment providing conversation, song, and dance for customers, though they would not sleep with them, not to be confused with prostitution, which they were not. The Tokugawas divided society into four classes, and the samurai class followed the ideology of Bushido, meaning the way of the warrior. But later in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the shogunate showed signs of weakening. Peasant unrest happened and taxes fell. Some of the samurai weren't even being paid and caused a lot of financial distress and some side hustles had to be done to make a living. But it came to a point where they later rallied together to shut down the Tokugawa shogunate. Keep watching as to how. I don't think you remember what happened before when you stopped paying us. Now pay up. But the newly educated were bringing up new ideas and fields of study. Western learning called rangaku or Dutch learning were brought over with concepts of Western medicine and human anatomy. There is also kokugaku or national learning that pushed more of native Japanese values as well. Yes, more knowledge, please. But then something grand happened that changed Japanese history forever. But then something grand happened that changed Japanese history forever. In the far distance, slowly coming towards the shores of Japan in 1853, definitely not the Mongolians like in the past, it was a fleet of American ships commanded by Commodore Matthew C. Perry who forced Japan to Howdy. open its borders, ending Japan's isolationist policies. You know what? It's time you guys opened up. We want to bring in Megadies. Now there was no defense against Perry's gunboats and Japan had little choice but to agree to his demands and start trading at Japanese ports. We have no choice. The US, Great Britain, Russia and other Western powers took advantage and started the unequal treaties. Yup, it was actually called that. Where Japan had to allow citizens of these countries to visit or reside in Japanese territory with no levy tariffs on their imports or try them in Japanese courts. Which becomes a huge issue later. Wait, now how fair is that? The shogunate's failure to oppose the Western powers angered many Japanese and even the samurai class silently planning in the background. Just wait and see. We got something to show you. But in August 1866, after Tokugawa Yoshinobu became shogun, he struggled to maintain power as civil unrest continued. The Choshu and Satsuma domains in 1868 convinced the young emperor Meiji and his advisors for an end to the Tokugawa shogunate. The armies of the Choshu and Satsuma soon marched on Edo, and the Boshing War led to the fall of the shogunate and the samurai. Wait, that wasn't supposed to happen. Then enters modern Japan, Meiji period. Now Emperor Meiji was the 122nd Emperor of Japan. Wow, a lot of lines of emperors. But nominal supreme power was restored to him in 1869 and the imperial family moved to Edo, which was then renamed as the name we know it as today as Tokyo. But during this time, we find that the most powerful men in the government were actually former samurai. Yeah, they were still around, rather than the emperor who was 15 at the time in 1868. You're too young, buddy. Don't worry, we'll take care of everything. There were some dramatic changes that happened in Japan where the leaders of the Meiji government pushed to have Japan become a modern nation state equal to Western imperialist powers. If we can't beat them, we join them. The Edo class structure disappeared. The domains of the daimyos were also gone. There were new tax reforms that came in and even lifted the bans on Christians. And railways, telegraph lines, and the universal education system sprung up. And it definitely was a new Japan with its widespread westernization. Many advisors from western nations in fields like education, 
banking, law, military affairs, and transportation actually remodeled Japan's institutions. The common Japanese even started to dress differently and even had Western hairstyles. The Japanese military even started to gain power in Asia and decided to expand abroad and believed to do so, they had to acquire its own colonies to compete with the Western colonial powers. So they decided to gain power over Hokkaido and turned its attention to China and Korea. Oh great, more war and destruction. But this time with better understanding of Western powers. In 1894, Japanese and Chinese troops clashed in Korea and the well-led forces defeated the more numerous and better equipped military of Qin China. The Japanese government started to gain enough international prestige to renegotiate the unequal treaties the Western world had set on them. That pissed them off back in the day and in 1902, Japan signed an important military alliance with the British. Okay, we finally sorted that one out. It was a chip on our shoulders, we needed to change and we did it. Now, anything is possible. Russia then came onto the plate and Japan clashed with them in expanding its power in Asia. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05 ended with the dramatic Battle of Tsushima, which was another victory for Japan's military. Japan laid claim to Korea in 1905, followed by full annexation in 1910. Now during this time of war, Japan also went through some rapid transition towards an industrial economy. Western technology and knowledge allowed for factories to be built to produce a wide range of goods and the majority of Japan's exports became manufactured goods. New successful businesses started to flourish like Zaibatsu, that included Mitsubishi and Sumitomo, and great industrial growth sparked rapid urbanization all across the country. Japan started to enjoy some economic growth and people started to live longer and healthier lives. The population actually rose from 34 million in 1872 to 52 million in 1915, and a lot of socialist ideas started to spring up entering the Taisho period. Now during this time, Japan developed stronger democratic institutions and grew in international power. There were mass protests and riots, even a riot called the Rice Riots of 1918 that increased the power of Japan's political parties. When Japan entered World War I, it actually led to sparked economic growth and earned Japan new colonies in the South Pacific seized from Germany. Japan ended up signing the Treaty Treaty of Versailles to enjoy international relations through its membership in the League of Nations. Then enters the Showa period. Emperor Hirohito's 63 year reign from 1926 to 1989 is actually known to be the longest in recorded Japanese history. Now in the beginning it was considered a period of rise of extreme nationalism with expansionist wars which ended with the suffering defeat of World War II. Japan was occupied by foreign powers for the first time in its history, but later re-emerged as a major world economic power. The period of 1937 would be a period to note. Now the Empire of Japan in 1937 was definitely a violent time. Fascism and Japanese nationalism kept growing in popularity. The extreme right became influential throughout the Japanese government and society. Listen to me, follow me. During all the changes and discontent that was happening in Japan at the time, the United States opposed Japan's invasion of China and placed economic sanctions to stop Japan from getting resources to continue its war in China. And because of this, Japan decided to form an alliance with Germany and Italy in 1940 which worsened its relations with the United States. That was definitely a no-no, guys. After that, in July 1941, the United States, the UK, and the Netherlands decided to freeze all Japanese assets when Japan completed its invasion of French Indochina by occupying the southern half of the country, further increasing tension in the Pacific. Guys, you are pushing our buttons. That's our territory. We won't let you touch it, even if it's in Asia and we are of Western power. What makes you think it belongs to you? On December 7, 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy launched a surprise attack on the American fleet of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Okay, that's the last straw. We're going to war, boys. And this is what brought the US into World War II on the side of the Allies. It also opened up the door for Japan to invade Asian colonies of the United States, the UK, the Netherlands, 
including the Philippines, Malaya, Hong Kong, Singapore, Burma, and the Dutch East Indies. And the answer to all of this by the United States was... An atomic bomb over Hiroshima in 1945. You were asking for it. A bomb being dropped on a completely innocent civilian population. Wait, did I just say that? Does that even make sense? And the answer to all of this by the United States was... An atomic bomb over Hiroshima in 1945. You were asking for it. A bomb being dropped on a completely innocent civilian population. Wait, did I just say that? Does that even make sense? While this was all going on, life for the civilians in Japan were getting worse. People had to ration food, there were electrical outages, and some had to hide from crackdowns on dissent. Saipan in 1944 was even captured by the US Army, so they can start with bombing raids on Japanese mainland. Close to half of the total area of Japan's major cities were destroyed. The Battle of Okinawa was another one, around April and June of 1945, that left 115,000 soldiers and 150,000 Okinawan civilians dead, where a landed war was about to take place into mainland Japan. But instead, on August 6th, 1945, the US decided to drop an atomic bomb over Hiroshima instead, killing over 70,000 people. They thought it was more efficient in killing civilians instead. Now this was the first nuclear attack in history, and the Soviet Union took full advantage of the situation and declared war on Japan. They went straight into invading Manchuria and other territories, and the Allies also decided to drop a second bomb on Nagasaki, killing around 40,000 people. Japan surrendered after this on August 14th, broadcasted by Emperor Hirohito on national radio the following day. A treaty of peace with Japan was signed on September 8, 1951, and some really dramatic political and social transformation took place. U.S. General Douglas MacArthur and Supreme Commander of Allied Powers played a central role in implementing reforms. They even broke up the zaibatsu and democracy and demilitarization of Japan's government and society were the top goals and it all happened pretty quickly. They still let the emperor stay in power, but he had to renounce his claims to divinity, which was a pillar of the state Shinto system. So in two years, Japan's new constitution came into effect in 1947. Shigeru Yoshida served as prime minister and guided Japan through the occupation and called it the Yoshida Doctrine. It was all about creating a closer relationship with the United States and for the development of the economy. He actually ended up being the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history. But through it all, the Japanese economy was still in bad shape in the immediate post-war years. But there was heavy manufacturing and heavy industry that occurred when the Korean War started that encouraged exports. Japan's economic growth was mostly because of the technology imported from the West and the close economic and defense cooperation with the United States. Japan's corporations even started to have this system of lifetime employment of loyal and experienced work people that assured their employees a safe job till retirement. Growing towards 1955, the economy had grown and kept growing and by 1968, it had become the second largest capitalist economy in the world after the United States. People started to live longer and Japan's population increased to 123 million by 1990. The average Japanese even became wealthy to purchase all these neat stuff being developed. Japan even became the world's largest manufacturer of cars and a leading producer of electronics like the Walkman. The Nikkei stock market index had doubled and the Tokyo Stock Exchange became the largest in the world. And during the economic bubble, stock and real estate loans grew rapidly and everyone was having a great time. Japan even became a member of the United Nations in 1956 and even hosted the Olympic Games in Tokyo in 1964. The Cold War with the Russians brought Japan into closer relations with the United States. The United States asked Japan to create a new army in 1954 under the name Japan Self-Defense Forces which actually pissed off a number of surrounding countries though. 
Japan's golden age of cinema even began because the government at the time decided to abolish censorship. It was also cheaper to make films with better film techniques and technology and became super popular in Japan. So now it brings us to the Heisei period. During this time, Emperor Akihito's reign began upon the death of his father, Emperor Hirohito. The economic bubble actually unfortunately popped in 1989 and stock and land prices plunged as Japan entered a deflationary spiral that they have yet to recover from today. The banks had tons of debt and wage stagnation worsened and the birth rate started to decline. They even called the 1990s as Japan's lost decade. The system of lifetime employment largely collapsed and unemployment rates rose. Also their relationships during the war legacy strained international relations, especially with China and Korea, never to be forgotten. But through the forgotten years of the 1990s and today, Japanese popular culture started to grow and is still around like the video games, anime and manga which spread throughout the world especially among young people. Well there you have it, the shortened series of Japan's history. It's super interesting to see what Japan will become in the next coming decades. I'm sure great things are ahead.